All right. Well, I'm excited to walk you through these seven principles. We've already started a little bit by talking about President Hinckley's wonderful quote about this great cause of liberty through Christ, agency, and truth. And, and this statement from Lehi that, that what we do in this life, if we have the freedom to choose liberty and eternal life through Christ or not, we choose captivity and death. So that liberty looks like Christ is the model. Complete submission is full power and control. That he is the only author of liberty. Those statements from King Benjamin, you remember how he says, to the people after they have all consecrated, covenanted, right? And he has said, you have a new name upon you. And then he makes this beautiful statement in chapter 5 of Mosiah, and under this head, ye are made free. And under no other head can you be made free. That is so different than the, than the ideas of the world that would say freedom comes from doing whatever one feels like when one feels like it. That that is captivity and death that liberty and freedom really only can come through submission to Christ and receiving his redeeming power. I love this beautiful statement from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You've heard maybe Elder Christofferson talk about him as, as a, great, um, a, a great religious instructor, teacher, pastor, who was incarcerated in Germany during World War II, and ultimately he was, he was killed. But we have these precious letters from Bonhoeffer coming out of prison to those of his congregations. And one of them, he talks about liberty, and he says, liberty means being free for the other. Now that caught me so much, because Christ himself, our, our Father in heaven, his Son Jesus Christ, are the most free of any beings. They are also the most governed. And what it enables them to be is to be free to be for us. When we as parents are not governed by Christ, it is our children who suffer. It is those that we would give to, those that we could bless, who are hindered by our lack, right, of government. And that when we are governed by Christ, when he is the source and author of our liberty, we are free to be for others fully. That's why this being of complete submission, full power and control, gave everything for us. We want children to understand that. Liberty comes through obedience to law, obedience to Christ, receiving his redeeming power. And that enables us to be for others. So the very first principle that they will study is divine identity and purpose. This is the foundational principle of all forms of government. Whatever it is they believe about the individual, that's reflected in the government. We're just reading together as a family about uh, the, the communist struggle in China. And Red Scarf Girl tells about that very difficult period when Mao was re reforming everyone. And you see in Cambodia, the communist struggle there, you see they were mantras over and over again. You are nothing but a grain of rice in the bowl, in the rice bowl. You are for the purpose of feeding others. The people's republic, the people's army, the sense that you as an individual are nothing. But at the core of the American founding is the inalienable rights given by a creator of life, liberty, and property that we are all equal. And so this is the core truth. And the gospel of Jesus Christ gives us far more insight because we know we are not only created by God, we are his children, children of loving heavenly parents who gave us the freedom to choose a divine identity and purpose, and that civil liberty is founded on the proof that this is inalienable, these rights are inalienable and God-given. So we learn from Moses that most glorious revelation where he is shown all of creation and it is astounded. This boy who had grown up as a prince of Egypt seeing the greatest that human beings could create and is totally overwhelmed seeing God and then God saying to him, Moses, thou art my son, and I have a work for thee to do. That scripture embodies this first principle that is the core of learning here. Thou art my son, the glory of creation, you are me. You have within you the seeds of divinity, and I have a work for you to do. 
we just talked about this, it is the core of, of all right philosophies and belief systems. There is an assumption about what it means to be a human being. That's why we have to get that so right. I love that uh, having gone to see um, the Pilgrim Village in Massachusetts, one of my first experiences there, we walked up and people would reenact what it is to be one of those pilgrims. So when you talk to them, they will speak to you as if they are my booster or right, one of, the, one of the family members there. And this woman saying to us as we talked to her, she said, all of us have the right to prophesy. This very key truth that the, that the Protestants brought, that not only is it, is it a priest who can teach me truth, but I myself, through the word of God, can be inspired by truth. I can receive salvation individually through the word of God, through, through Jesus Christ. That is part of the founding. So what happened is that belief that I could receive the truths of God through scripture as an individual meant I could be free as an individual and equal. I had a civil responsibility as much as I had a religious responsibility. This religious equality meant civil equality. And it started there at the heart. Okay, and of course we talked about the Christian idea of the child but that that is founded in that, that's grounded in that principle, first principle as well, as well, this identity and purpose. The second of the principles of personal and civil liberty is that liberty comes through Christian self-government. We've already talked about this, but that Christ, as we seek to obey the teachings of Jesus Christ and receive his grace, we will experience liberty. That obedience cannot save us but only in and through the blood of Jesus Christ, that he, that he enables our liberty through dependence on him and his atoning power. He is the great liberator. That quote from Mosiah, your hearts are changed through faith and you have become free under this head. I want to go to one wonderful quote from that I have loved from uh, A Little House on the Prairie, but before we get to that, we also focus here on, this is a quote from President Oaks, just talking about how we cannot be free as a society unless there is widespread adherence to moral law. There cannot, as we have seen in, in the most recent months, there cannot be enough police force, right, to enforce obedience to law. Our society is held together by voluntary obedience to the unenforceable, and by widespread adherence to unwritten norms of right or righteous behavior. That's why John Adams would say, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions, unbridled by morality and religion. Then he ends, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That is why this principle of self-government is core to liberty. We cannot be free as a society unless there is widespread adherence to moral law, voluntarily chosen. This powerful story in, in the series of Little House on the Prairie series where Laura is a growing young woman, she's 15 or 14 years old, they go to celebrate the 4th of July there in North Dakota. And they hear recited aloud, this, this little impoverished community recites aloud the Declaration of Independence. It was like it was just part of their core. And she says, as she heard them sing, and heard them recite that, and then they sing, they sing to him, our fathers, God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. They sang that as a community. She said, she writes this, God is America's king. Americans won't, Americans won't obey any king on earth. Americans are free. That means they have to obey their own consciences. And then she goes down and says, Pa, I will get older and Pa and Ma cannot tell me what to do and there isn't anyone else who has a right to give me orders. I will have to make myself be good. Her whole mind seemed to be lighted up by this thought. This is what it means to be free. It means you have to be good. Our Father's God, author of liberty, the laws of nature and of nature's God, endow you with the right to life and liberty. Then you have to keep the laws of God. For God's law is the only thing that gives you a right to be free. Is that remarkable understanding? The third principle then that, they focus, that we focus on here at the school is that Christ is the model of all character. 
Christ-like character is what develops when we receive his grace and choose obedience to him. And that America's heritage provides examples of men and women who were liberated by obedience to the teachings of Jesus Christ and sought that liberty for others. I will walk you through a few examples. The Americas were destined, this is, this is from one of our prophets, to in the providences of the God, to be a place of liberty so that in them the gospel might be restored and its saving message go throughout the world. We see that embodied in our pilgrim women. There's nothing so, I think of all the beautiful statues in Plymouth to honor the Pilgrim Foundation, there's none so beautiful as that honoring of the pilgrim women. 17 of them, that first winter, planted here on American soil, seeking to stay alive and keep their little community alive. By the end of that first winter, 13 had died. More came, but it was their fortitude and strength that to be so honored kept this community. To those intrepid English women whose courage, fortitude, and devotion brought a new nation into being. And on the back of it says, they brought up their families in sturdy virtue and a living faith in God, without which nations perish. We hear the pilgrims during that first winter, William Radford writes in the landing of the pilgrim, this is quoted in the landing of the pilgrim, but it's written in the Plymouth Plantation by William Radford that then went to England in that second year and third year and inspired the British colonies with, with just, wow, what was happening. But he just describes during that first winter when they were so sick, everyone was sick, six or seven would be well enough to help care for each other and clean their clothes and all of the filth that was part of their sicknesses. And then just talking about the charity that was shown to one another. A rare example he ends with, and worthy to be remembered. These were individuals changed by Christ. Thus he ends, out of small beginnings, greater things have been produced by his hand. And as one small candle may light a thousand, so the light here kindled hath shown unto many, yea, in some sort to our whole nation. He could see, Bradford could see, what God's purposes were for this nation. One small candle, this fledgling little community could light a thousand. And we see it grow. Freedom at that time would not have been recognized as doing whatever the one wanted. But moral freedom was a liberty to do only that which is good, just, and honest. John Winthrop wrote, a governor of the Plymouth Colony after Bradford, we see that example in George Washington, this man who could have become king and gave all that power up because he wanted so much for others to know liberty. More to say on each of these people. Abraham Lincoln, his second inaugural address, where he himself had gone through a conversion of sorts to understanding the purposes of God, and ends with that powerful statement with malice toward none with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, and, and extending charity to the South. I could talk lots about these stories, we don't have time, but there are other glorious black heroes who have become more of a focus here at American Heritage School and have needed to be. That remarkable George Washington Carver, I don't know of a better man who's ever lived. This remarkable scientist who on his, on his uh, Headstone says he could have added fortune to fame, spent his years at Tuskegee as a scientist, but caring for neither, he found happiness and honor in being helpful to the world. Your children will read his remarkable biography in the seventh grade and be so deeply inspired by it. John Lewis, who just passed away, who was late in state, the first black American to have that honor, Rights of the civil rights movement, of religion, of our heritage in the civil rights movement, of religion, guiding that movement, writing, without religious faith and religious liberty, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. It could never have made it. There standing at Edmund Pettus Bridge on a bloody Sunday in that march from Selma, in that effort to get to the Capitol building from Selma, they stood there at the Edmund Pettus Bridge and saw in front of them those state troopers ready to hurt them, ready to stop them. And John Lewis says to the man next to him who's leading the march, we couldn't go forward, we couldn't go back. There was only one option left that I could see. We should kneel and pray. 
And that group of marchers were then Bloody Sunday that then went throughout the world and led President Johnson to opening up the Civil Rights Act that led for them to have the opportunity to vote, to have those protections, those voting protections. And it was religious faith, it was the churches, it was black churches, the only place where they could gather, inspired not a perfect movement, but a big chunk of that movement guided by a belief in, that Christ needed them to be free and that they could be governed by Christ's principles in seeking that liberty. Roosevelt's prayer for the nation during the middle of World War II, nothing like it in the whole history of the world. On radio, he gathers just on the eve before that large amphibious assault that was so important for D-Day, knowing they needed help, desperately needed help, he calls the nation together in prayer. This powerful prayer that was then answered by heaven. The fourth principle, and so that third principle is Christ changes us. We can develop Christ-like character, and America has a unique heritage of Christian character that is a light to the world. Not perfect. In fact, one of its great stories is that there is redemption. Thinking of the spirit of America that overcame slavery, that overcame Jim Crow laws, that is working today to overcome further. That is the spirit of America that they will come to love and honor. Fourth, that the greatest property that God has endowed each of his children, in contrast to communist and Marxist ideas, with the right of personal property, and that that personal property, the greatest of which is the conscience that has been given to every human being, by which we must abide in order to have liberty. God has granted each of us stewardship over our individual souls, labors, and possessions. The most sacred stewardship God has given us is our conscience, and that we experience liberty through obedience to that conscience. Of course, you have the prophet Joseph himself, so persecuted for obedience to conscience at a time in America's history when we had not yet fully come to understand religious liberty. But how he says, it is one of the first principles of my life, in my feelings, that liberty of conscience, in my feelings, I am always ready to die for the protection of the weak, and oppressed in their just rights. Your children will come to love wonderful examples. John Lathrop, this man so persecuted in his efforts to change and reform the church in England, who then comes to America and is important in the founding. Joan of Arc gives her life, could not recant, could not go against what she knew to be true about the direction she had received from heaven to help friends. And then Martin Luther, who puts up his 95 theses, and in the patriotic program, you'll hear this powerful quote, your children will learn, because they'll hear it so many times, embedded in my mind, him saying, I cannot and will not recant, as, the, as he's there before the Council of Kent, telling him, you must recant, or you will be stripped of all your priestly robes, and could lead to his death. And how he boldly says, I cannot and will not recant, for it is neither safe nor expedient to act against conscience. Here I take my stand. I can do no otherwise. So help me, God. Not a perfect man, but one who God could use because of obedience to conscience to lead to the Reformation and ultimately the restoration of the gospel. Eric Little, that remarkable runner who dies in China, this is Chariots of Fire, dies in China as a missionary after his Olympic gold medals, could not say no to honoring the Sabbath whatever would come. They will hear great stories like that. They will learn the difference, like David Brooks has said, between our current culture, guilt culture, versus shame culture. In a guilt culture, you know you are good or bad by what your conscience feels. In a shame culture that we have created today, you know you are good or bad by what your community says about you, by whether it honors or excludes you. So David Brooks, powerfully says, in the shame culture, moral life is not built on a continuum of right and wrong. It's built on a continuum of exclusion and inclusion. We need children who can see through that and understand that liberty and leading and power and leadership come by obedience to conscience. And with that is stewardship. So every single day, they will be talked to about stewardship. They'll have stewardship minutes where they are asked to clean up their desk area and in the classroom. 
because God has given each of us gifts through creation in our own bodies, minds, and the property that we have, and what we do with our minds that then becomes our property, and that we have a stewardship over it, and that we will answer to God for the use of that stewardship. It was those governing principles that caused that first group in Boston to write in those committees of correspondence, no taxation without representation. They understood the principles of stewardship and property that God had given them. Principle number five, they will learn that there are three cores to having liberty as a nation. The family. We have to have strong families, nations of strong families, because liberty and development cannot be protected without that. We have to have religious freedom, and we have to have these three pieces that are part of the restraints on government. A representative form of government, the separation of powers among the three branches, and federalism with a division between the national federal government and the state government to become protective of local liberties. Principle number six is that when we cultivate Christian self-government among ourselves and as a community, we want to cultivate liberty for others. That is what the great American heritage is, right? That to protect Christ's followers are obligated to cultivate and protect the right of self-government for all mankind. And so we see examples of the prophet Joseph who wrote, a man touched by the love of God is not content to just care for himself, but seeks to reign throughout the world, blessing the whole human race. That was the sons of Mosiah. It was the sons of Helaman. They could not just watch over themselves, just watch out for their own salvation, but sought to bless the whole human race. We see that in these remarkable people from our heritage, Samuel Adams, Jonas Clark, you have to stand at Lexington Green and honor Jonas Clark, this remarkable man who, the pastor of that little community who had bred them with a belief and trust in God and seeking liberty, that God wanted them to be free, and how they stood boldly before those British soldiers, that very first battle of the revolution, determined, determined to have a nation where there could be freedom. He was the source of their inspiration. It was the churches, the pulpits, that flamed with a love for liberty. And then Joseph Warren, that great hero, Mrs. Cornell would teach us in the fifth grade, who gave his life there at the Battle of Bunker Hill, this prophet, many said he would have been George Washington if he had not been taken home. But here he was, this man who writes as he's just before, in 1775, just before he is killed later that summer, on you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the important question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn, as if he could see the future before him, the place that America would play in God's plan. I mentioned already the Adams family, this remarkable family, who inbred was this in un unremitted desire to serve this nation and to build democracy. They saw it as their responsibility. And then we come to that seventh principle, and all the others lead to this fullness of liberty through unity with God and man that God's whole purpose is the sealing together of the whole human race, the whole human family, and that that is where liberty is fully experienced. We see that in a free market economy. Liberty under law leads to unity, which allows for the thriving of an economy. So your children will learn in the 12th grade when they study a lot about economics, they'll learn the power of these principles in, in, this, in leading to unity through a free economy. But not only that, but that ultimately God's purposes are to build Zion, a oneness for us. And that that union is established by covenant together, obedience to law, internal unity. Of course, that statement from Christ. I've been so struck just in a final moment speaking of today in, in looking at woke, the ideas of a woke culture, and, and how powerful it is to know we need to continually seek to be better, to be more at one, to be more true to our brethren and sisters, whatever race, right? Changes need to happen. But when you look at woke culture, what it assumes is a Marxist ideology of this contention between classes that no one has responsibility for and no one can change. It just is. It's exactly what, what Sherman now had all of those children memorize. 
during the Cultural Revolution. You are, by, by, by your whiteness in this case, you are by your heritage of having landowners in China, you are inherently an oppressor. Now, what it misses is that we need, we need to be changed by Christ individually, that there's a responsibility each of us have morally to one another. But that woke culture only ends up leading to division, and in Mark's, Mark's words, in Chairman Mao's words, continual revolution. Instead, Christ says, come to me, you are each independent, individual, and free. Come to me. I will change you and make you one. True oneness. All races. All brothers and sisters. All brought together. And that starts with principles that are true at the heart. Principles one, two, three, four, five, six, that then lead to oneness. And our hope is that the children will master those principles all along the way and experience in their classrooms that joy that comes through a fullness in Christ, that oneness, a fullness of liberty. I hope you will love these principles and continue to teach them to your children as they are learning them here at the school. And our hope, of course, is that all of us may come to be one in Christ. Thank you for letting me share these with you today.